three or four years after that. So the most important difference between history and current events is with history, you have enough time that's elapsed to figure out what really mattered and what didn't. So you went back and said Reykjavik's much more interesting because it's much more important 30 years later. Let's take a look at that. Reykjavik seemed a failure at the time. Yeah. In, in fact, I got a photograph in the book of Reagan and Gorbachev coming out of their last meeting. And failure is written all over their faces. But it turns out that it did set the stage for the important agreements that came on in the next 10 years. Because it was two people who could then trust each other or knew each other? Why, why was it seemed a failure, but it was actually a success? That business of the personal trust was really important. There was another thing, too, and that is... Reagan and Gorbachev both got swept up in the moment, and they came close to agreeing to a deal that probably neither one actually could have delivered when they went home. The Senate probably would have rejected a deal that eliminated nuclear weapons for the United States, and the Soviet Politburo would have done the same thing. So it was actually a good thing that they didn't quite make it because they would have had to defend something that would have turned out to be politically indefensible. Right. H.W. Brands, our guest, his book is called Reagan, The Life Tonight, 7 o'clock book signing, book reading. You looked at new sources of information. What's available today that has not been available before? There were two major sources that I had access to that other biographers did not. One is Reagan's almost complete diary. And this is something that biographers earlier have not had a chance to look at. Reagan used it in his own memoir, but when you're writing your own story, that's a different thing. And then there were lots of minutes, accounts of top secret meetings that took place between Reagan and the National Security Council staff, Reagan and his policy planning group. So it allowed me to fill in the details of Reagan's thinking. It allowed me to pretty much, I think, dispel the old notion, this is especially prevalent among Reagan's critics, that he was an empty suit, that he was right. an empty-headed actor who was reading lines written for him by somebody else. Reagan, I've been able to document, was thoroughly involved with what he was doing. Now, he did focus on certain elements of policy more than others. He wasn't a detailed guy in everything, but when he focused on something like U.S. relations with the Soviet Union, he was all there. H.W. Brand's our guest. Let's go back to the movie uh, back to the Future, because in 1985, that movie comes out, and they go back to 1955, and there's a funny line by George McFly talking to a, a, a mad scientist, and he says, who's president in 1985? And he says, Ronald Reagan. The actor? Turns out, a failed actor in 1955, 30 years later, becomes the most powerful man in the world. How does a failed actor with no real... Uh, no real signs of any political, you know, savor comes to become the most powerful man in the world. That's the intriguing question of Reagan's life because he didn't even think about politics seriously until he was 50 years old. And this was because his film career had failed. His TV career had failed. He didn't know what he was going to do. And he ne basically needed a job. Right. So he announces he's going to run for governor. I mean, it's a little bit more complicated than that. But for the biographer, the question is, I know what he becomes. I know that he becomes, I, I make the argument in the book, that he's one of the two most important presidents of the 20th century. You know, like it or not, he changed America. Right. But I'm trying to figure out what in his first 50 years would give indications that that was that. And some of it was that he was actually a lot smarter than people gave him credit for being. But the other thing was, he was a great opportunist in the sense that he saw what opportunities were available and he took advantage of them. Well, and the and final thing was, and this actually is a theme that runs through his whole life, he was somebody who was always looking for a new and bigger stage. He first stepped on the stage as a young child when his mother would put him on stage in church skits and plays. And he had had a difficult childhood and he discovered that being on stage, hearing people's applause, making people laugh, tended to ease the anxieties of childhood. And he gravitated towards stages. So he went from school plays to college plays. He went to radio. He went to film. He went to television. They went into politics, which gave him the biggest stage of all. He was originally a liberal, wasn't he? He was, but he was a relatively unthinking liberal in the sense that he was a new... <laughs> That's a loaded well, answer. <laughs> I didn't want... That came out different than I wanted it to sound. <laughs> but, but he inherited the liberalism of his father. Okay. His father had a low-level position in Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. And Reagan grew up not having thought about politics, and so he naturally gravitated toward the politics of, of the family. But as he got to thinking about it more, he realized that his philosophy trended much more in a conservative direction. And so he gravitated across the political spectrum from Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal to essentially Barry Goldwater's conservatism by mm -hmm. the 1960s. H.W. 
Brands, our guest. He is one of the best in terms of storytelling and a historian. He puts it all together in a new book called Reagan, The Life, tonight, 7 o'clock, for a book signing and a book reading. He, in 1980, uh, after he's done with the uh, governorship of uh, uh, California, he runs for president and loses to Gerald Ford in the primaries. Take us through that. How does Ronald Reagan, beloved by the conservative movement, lose to Gerald Ford? So Reagan ran for governor and won in California in 1966. He ran for president the first time in 1968. It was a sort of half-hearted effort. It was really too soon. He didn't get very far. But in 1976, he makes the very bold and unorthodox decision of a Republican to challenge a sitting Republican president. There were a whole lot of people who thought that, boy, this guy just, he doesn't have the good of the party at heart. He's way too brash. And he splits the party. He loses to Jerry Ford in 1976, partly because Ford is the incumbent, and incumbent presidents have a big advantage right. there on the news all the time. The other reason is that the Republican Party remained split over what the meaning of Republicanism was. There had long been a split between the conservatives in the Republican Party and the moderates. And this is when Barry Goldwater got the nomination of the Republican Party in 1964. That was a win for the conservatives. But Barry Goldwater went down to a disastrous defeat to Lyndon Johnson. Right. So that gave a boost to the moderates in the party, and they nominated Richard Nixon in 1968. And so as late as the mid-1970s, there was still this battle for the soul of the Republican Party. When Jerry Ford got the nomination in 1976, defeating Reagan, and lost the presidency, that was pretty much the death knell for Republican moderates. When Reagan gets the nomination in his own right in 1980, as a full-throated conservative, that marks what I would say is the modern era of the Republican Party, when from 1980 until now, it's been all conservative all the time. However, there are some people, H.W. Brands, the author of the book Reagan, um, that they say Ronald Reagan couldn't get nominated now. He's too liberal for the own party that he's created. There were two Ronald Reagans. There was Ronald Reagan, the candidate, and Ronald Reagan, the president. Or you could say there was Ronald Reagan, the speech giver, and Ronald Reagan, the, the one who actually governed. Reagan was 100% conservative in all of his speeches. You can read the speeches from the first one he gave in 1964 to the last one in his farewell address in 1989. And what Reagan says is something that even the most zealous Tea Party activist resonates to today. So it is full conservatism. But Reagan understood that once you get elected, then you actually have to govern. And you don't get to enact everything you said you were going to try to govern. He used to say that he would rather get 80% of what he wanted than go over the cliff with his flags flying. And that's that pragmatic Reagan that would sometimes give the Tea Party types indigestion today. Mm -hmm. You can do that in 1985. Can you do that in 2015? It's a lot harder to do it today because the two parties have sifted out philosophically. So as late as the 1980s, there were conservative Democrats. In fact, Reagan Democrats were an important constituency of President Reagan. There aren't any conservative Democrats, and there aren't any liberal Republicans. So the two parties now are more fully divided than they were back then. However, I still think there's a role for charisma in politics. And so a president who can somehow reach across party lines, more precisely, reach out to the broader public, can get votes from across the aisle. He was, let's see, I was in high school when he was shot. And uh, they sent everybody home, and he makes it back. And, and, and how much of him being shot changed his presidency and how much did he change both physically and mentally there were a couple of aspects of that reagan survived the the assassination attempt narrowly but his health returned so he didn't have any lingering effects from that physically but it seems to have well as it naturally would it, it made him think that life on earth is short and he better make good use of his time. So he recommitted himself to the big reasons for which he had been elected president. He said, okay, I'm not gonna sweat the small stuff, I'm gonna focus on the big deal. The other thing that it did was to make Americans appreciate the fact that their president had survived. And the, he survived this ordeal with wonderful grace. He was able to tell jokes when he was about to go under the knife. He joked to the, the opera, the doctors who can operate them, I hope you're all Republicans. Right. And the answer was, Mr. President, we're all Republicans today. Right. And Reagan was enough of a showman and a performer to milk that for what it was worth. When he first returned to public life and gave a speech before Congress, he, you know, he reveled in the applause and he just brought it all in and then he turned immediately to his tax and budget program 
and push that down the, the throats of Democrats in Congress. So he took advantage of his own oh, he did. of his own shooting. Reagan Reagan was often described as an actor, which is true enough. He had been, but that often that connotes that he was reading lines written by somebody else. In fact, more important than that, Reagan was a performer. He knew how to command a stage. He knew when he had the stage. He knew when he had an audience in his hand and how to make use of that. I will. I contend, even though again looking through the prism of my own bias, but he his State of the Union speeches are so fantastic. St- they just still, I don't know what he, I don't remember what he said, but the way he just resonated and the way he told it, he brought a tear to your eye. He was called the great communicator for a reason. And he learned his political chops on radio, listening to Franklin Roosevelt, giving the fireside chats in the 1930s. And Reagan came to understand what power a president can have if he can convey his vision of where the country ought to go to the American people. Because the American people will then will return that with greater political influence. So what Roosevelt was to radio, Reagan became to television. Mm -hmm. And he was a master at that medium. Uh, Okay, so Ronald Reagan gets elected in 1980, beats beats, uh, Jimmy Carter, and we have uh, hostages in Iran for 444 days, and they are released almost as he's being sworn in as president of the United States. Was that orchestrated, and why did that happen at exactly that time? Exactly why it happened, and exactly then, is a source of remaining mystery. There's no question that the Reagan campaign wanted to make sure that the hostages were not released ahead of the election. Bill Casey, who was Reagan's campaign manager, would become his CIA director, was deeply involved in getting the word out that this would be inconvenient for the United States. They called that the October Surprise. Well, in fact, they, the Reagan people were afraid there was going to be this October Surprise, but that's the label that's often applied to it. Casey's a slippery guy. It's hard to pin him down. But there was no doubt that the, the campaign worried that if Carter gained the release of the hostages before the election, it would be a big victory. The Reagan people were able to spin it, though, as if Carter got the release of the hostages ahead of the election, then it would have been as a result of some sly, underhanded deal that didn't serve the interests of the United States. Now, at the time in 1980, when the allegations were abroad that the campaign, the Reagan campaign, had done something to interfere with this, they were swept aside as no one would ever do such a thing as that. Trade weapons to Iran for hostages? Well, in fact, the story gained legs after the Iran-Contra scandal surfaced when it's quite clear that President Reagan's administration had done exactly that. Right. So, but we don't know. We we have, it's lost to history. There's, well, there's certainly evidence that Bill Casey tried to persuade the Iranian government not to release the hostages. Whether that had any effect is unknown. In fact, the Iranians had their own reason not to do Jimmy Carter any favors because the reason the hostage was taken in the first place is that the Iranians despised Jimmy Carter for allowing the Shah of Iran into the United States. So even if the Reagan campaign had had nothing to do with this, the Iranians weren't going to, they didn't want to see Jimmy Carter reelected. The book is called Reagan, The Life. Uh, H.W. Brands is our guest. He's fantastic. I'm a bit of a super fan. And you can meet him and have a book signed by him tonight, 7 o'clock at St. Louis County Library for a book signing and a book reading. What question would you ask Ronald Reagan today if you could? I would ask him to explain in greater detail exactly how his political views changed in the period from 1945 to 1962. In 45, he was still a card-carrying Democrat, he, he had voted for Franklin Roosevelt four times. By 1964, he is the flag bearer, essentially, of Republican conservatism. The reasons that he gives are mildly plausible, but they're not quite persuasive. It's, it involves his feelings that communism was a bigger threat than it was. It's certainly a pocketbook question. He was paying taxes at the marginal rate of 90%, and anybody would think those are a bit high. Right. Some of it, though, and I would really like to try to pin on how much of it was political opportunism, because he saw that there was an opening for this new role for himself. It's, it's like he's, he's taking a new screen test when he goes into politics. He's got this new role, and it was obvious that that sex, success was going to come on the Republican side. Right. So how much of it is so It was an easier path for him to make. Yeah. Um, he, he signed an amnesty bill. He, he raised taxes. He cut a deal with Social Security or with Tip O'Neill, all things that would get him ostracized today. Um, was it, in your, your argument is that it was just pragmatism? It was the right time, right place? It, he had to do what it was he had to do? Or, was it, or did he really think there were a place for 
uh, amnesty for immigrants and things like that. Oh, he, he believed in the policies that he put his signature to. But he, he believed that in a pluralist democracy, nobody gets everything that he wants. And so he was all for tax cuts, but he increased taxes where necessary to get a better deal on the budget. Now, Reagan was not at all doctrinaire. And the Republican Party, at least many of the candidates of the Republican Party, have become more doctrinaire. So Reagan was someone who believed that there are these conservative goals we're aiming for, but you don't hold progress today hostage to some dream that you hope to get sometime in the future. H.W. Brands, ladies and gentlemen, uh, his book is Reagan the Life. His son is a Democrat. His adopted son is a card-carrying, right-wing, died-in-the-world conservative talk show. His, uh, he's had some family issues, but he, he, his, his legacy is not necessarily with his family and not necessarily with his story, but with his perceived story. Reagan is an icon of the Republican Party, and the iconic part of Reagan is part of Reagan. It's not the whole of Reagan. Now, in fairness to Republican candidates and the people who are still giving speeches, they haven't been president. And once you're president, you realize that if you're going to accomplish anything, you do have to compromise. I've often been asked, could Reagan get the Republican nomination today? And right. the answer is yes, if he hadn't been president. Because Reagan in 1979 and 1980 was saying all the conservative stuff that conservative candidates are saying today. Right. It's just that when you put somebody in office, that they realize there's more to life than making speeches. And I suspect that any of the Republican candidates today if that person should get elected, yeah. would find himself drawn by the pragmatism of Reagan. Researching your book on Roosevelt, is that how you came to, to Reagan? How did you come to Reagan? What was the reason you came to Reagan now? Reagan is the sixth and final volume in a series of biographies that I've been doing that add up to a history of the United States. The fifth one was on Franklin Roosevelt. So I asked myself, who carries the story forward after Franklin Roosevelt dies in 1945? I needed someone who kind of bookended the other end of the American century. Franklin Roosevelt is the liberal, you could call him the lift, liberal left parenthesis of the American century. Reagan is a conservative right parenthesis. They are mirror images of each other. Each had this idea of what the presidency can accomplish. Each understood the United States needed to play this leading role in the world. One of them pushed the pendulum in a liberal direction, that's Roosevelt. Reagan pushes it back in a conservative direction. H.W. Brands, what's, what's next for you after this? I'm going to take a break from the big biographies. <laughs> By the way, I loved you in the uh, uh, um, history series, The Men Who Built America. Oh, thanks. That was a great one. That was yeah. a great yeah. television series. H.W. Yeah. Brands, tonight, 7 o'clock, St. Louis County Library for a book signing and a book reading his new book, Reagan, The Life. Don't miss it. Bring a friend. Back in a moment, Big 550 KTRS. This is McGraw Live on KPLR 11.2, stltoday.com, and the Big 550 KTRS. Hi, Damien.